Yeah, we just hop on, hop on. Uh, it's usually easier. Yeah. Dan's just sent me an email. I've just received something from Frank once again. What's a Zoom invite? I thought I sent down one. One second. Why is my thing working? Uh, Nola, sorry, are you there? Can Nola? You? Yes, I am. Nola, uh, did you just want to try logging in from the email, the link which says that, uh, not the one to test the platform, but the one which says enter the session 15 minutes. Did you click on that link and try? Yes. And that also goes nowhere? Yeah, I passed to that dashboard and, uh, and then... Yeah, and then it just has the preview when I search for my name. Um, and I press on the preview and it just does nothing. So I'm not sure. Uh, you, have you got Google uh, Chrome set as your default browser? Yes, I have. I, I got out of all the, everything else just to. This is crazy. Make I don't sure. Know. Um, it is crazy. I'm just trying to um, look through all these emails and just see which one. <laughs> oh dear. I did sign in and sign up. I did all that. Yeah, Dan is just asking for the Zoom link. I'm just trying to find the Zoom link that I sent everybody. I don't understand. I quit and started again. You we are now live. Right? Right? I'm in theory streaming, but I don't think anybody's in the room Gosh. anyway. Yeah. I just went back and I tried it again and it just worked. So I don't understand. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just don't think anything's working for me at the moment. Can you get on Zoom, Nella? Except my microphone, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, that's working perfectly on... Uh... Sure. And did he say you can use Zoom? Yeah, Nola, are you on Zoom um, at the moment? Oh, wait, it's saying join now. Okay. Wait, it's saying join. It's gone from um, being... Oh, it's still not letting... It's gone from being... Oh. <laughs> oh, technology. Join, but... Hi, greetings from sunny Tel Aviv. Okay. Okay, Dan is Dan is now there, and Thomas. Well, um, Nola, why don't you hop on Zoom, and I will then you share screen. Okay. Mahana, does that seem to work? Yeah, that's fine. Um, because at the moment there doesn't seem to be any any no. audience, so this is a a fairly intriguing <laughs> conference. But the main thing is, I really, really want to introduce all of you to each other. So. Uh, this is this is wonderful. So, so Nola, if you're if you're there, I will I, I will share screen, uh, and then we will uh, we will be able to uh, to have a nice conversation. So uh, that's really what I, I'm most interested. Nola, can you hear me on Zoom? Yes, I can hear you.
you can hear me now, can you? Okay, there we go. Hello. 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 <laughs> well, maybe this is a, a, a private conversation. Oh, how, how, Mahana, how are you? Can you see any of oh, the things? Oh, what? Thomas is also center. Okay, what are we doing? Are we are we continuing here? Are we going on Zoom? What are we doing? Well, I think I mean if we do, I, if you stay, if you get on Zoom as well, then we can make sure that you've uh, that we're all having the having the same conversation on Zoom, which is. Then uh, why don't I get on Zoom then? I'll, I'll quit here. Well, no, we shouldn't because in theory, someone else might come in. <laughs> and they'll um, miss you. <laughs> They haven't come in yet. Oh. They will, will come in. We are five minutes. Yes. Long. The thousands of people that are going to join the session, yeah, yeah. one of them would have actually made it here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The right place. So I think we can close the session and, and we meet on Zoom. All right. Let's, let's do that then. What, are we going on Zoom? Yeah, I think so. On yeah. the LinkedIn sent, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, yes, and I just do something. Um, brilliant. <laughs> well, so Mahana will Mahana. be with us in a second. So, can we stop sharing screen? Uh, what? No, let's keep let's keep on there. One second. Yeah. Well, this is extraordinary. I'm so sorry about this. Great, Mahana, there we go. Well, I, I will now begin with how I was going to. Um, so um, really, it's a great pleasure to have five people that I really want to, uh, or four people I really want to introduce to each other. Thomas, uh, Thomas Bjorkman has been a very successful financier and uh, has got a fabulous vision for the world. Um, which is really our aim is to educate, inspire, and empower people to be a positive force for change in society in our lives and those around them. And he's got a number of initiatives that I'd love him to talk about. Uh, Dan Dennison has been a really close friend for the last 30 years uh, and has looked at corporate culture over that period of time. And we've been on many adventures together to South Africa, China, and elsewhere. Nola is uh, doing incredible work uh, around the whole area of looking at our shared heritage, but also how we get people to start thinking collectively. And uh, Mohana is a, a new person that I've been introduced to, but is originally from India and has done an incredibly successful job of setting up in uh, a business in, uh, in Oman and joins us from Oman today. So we have one person from, uh, from each, from the, all of the continents, pretty much. So uh, it, it's really great to have you all here. But Thomas, do you think you could start, please, with a little bit about your vision and your background uh, and what your your really your your vision is? Because I think what Nola is doing, Mahana and Dan, it's all it's all relevant and links. So, so I will be very brief. Um, uh, I'm Swedish. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Started businesses in. IT, property, and in, in banking. Uh, ten years ago, a little bit more than ten years ago, I had the opportunity to sell uh, my banking business to the fourth largest Swiss banking group. And after serving as chairman of the banking group in Scandinavia for a couple of years, uh, I had the opportunity to leave business. And I then uh, took some time off to think about what to do with the second half of my life. I was 50 then, I'm now 63. And I decided that I wanted to set up a foundation in Sweden, the Oak Island Foundation, the Exarit, that really looks into the connection between our inner personal development and growth and societal change. Um, I've written three books, The Market Myth, The Nordic Secret, and uh, The World We Create. Uh, I've started the initiatives in London, uh, the Perspectiva Research Institute and the Rebel Wisdom Media Channel and in Berlin, the co-creation loft and the Emerge Media Platform. And I think that we are right now in a very deep, in the beginning of a very deep societal shift, a very deep cultural shift, 
that it also involve a shift in worldview and also a shift in consciousness. And uh, all my initiatives aim in different ways to try to support or facilitate this uh, cultural uh, transition. Uh, some people are talking about that we are leaving modernity and even the postmodern critique of modernity behind and perhaps moving into something that we call and call a meta modern society, where I think one of the key ingredients is in the, that new society is to really integrate all the previous cultural insights that humanity has accumulated during the last tens of thousands of years, integrating both indigenous knowledge, pre-modern knowledge, modern and post-modern knowledge. So that's, that's a quick introduction of what where I am and where I think the world is. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, do you have you selected just one of the top two or three inner development goals that you feel are the most relevant? Yeah. Yes. So, so I, I believe that this shift that we are in is a shift that is a cultural shift. It's a shift in consciousness. But in order for us to be able to participate meaningfully in that shift and all to contribute in this shift, because I believe that this shift, just like any other shifts back in the history of humanity, is going to be a bottom-up process. This shift is not going to be a top-down process. But it will demand more inner capacities, capacities that we might have had previously in our human history and that we have lost or some capacities we might even re need to find uh, completely anew. So one way of talking uh, about this in a language that makes it more accessible to uh, the general public is to say that in order for us, for example, to be able as humans to engage with these large, almost existential collective challenges that we are facing right now, where, of course, the, the challenges to democracy and the challenges to our environment might be the two biggest ones. Um, the reason why we are not engaging more with these uh, challenges might be that we as individuals do not have the cognitive capacity nor the emotional capacity to grasp the severity of these problems. And then we develop psychological defenses like plain denial of these problems or rationalizations that, well, I can't do very much as an individual anyhow. And we believe that in order for, for example, to reach the global development goal, the sustainable development goal, the SDGs, we actually first need to reach the inner development goals and develop these sorts of capacities uh, uh, that we need. And what could they be? Well, it could be, for example, our uh, capacity to see the world from more perspectives. So active perspective taking could be one inner capacity that we need to develop. Our uh, reach and depth of compassion, self-compassion and empathy could, could be other uh, capacities that we need to develop. So we are, from our foundation, developing a framework that we call the Inner Development Goals that tries to identify uh, the most important inner capacities that we need to facilitate in development, but also to build a toolbox around them and say, this is actually how we can go about uh, increasing our capacity, for example, for compassion. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the next person, I'd love Nola. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here because obviously you've been, uh, you're from the uh, Wijeru uh, tribe. Sorry, forgive my, uh, probably not the uh, the correct pronunciation, but could you tell me a little bit about your work? Uh, because I think it's very relevant to uh, I'm talking about shared heritage and the, the whole area around uh, the difference between individual and collective and what you see missing in society uh, and why you're excited yeah. about things. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, delay Go. for a second. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Hello, everybody. Um, Gowan Bernard. Is, hello, welcome in uh, Radri. Radri is my um, language group from New South Wales in Australia. What is New South Wales now? Um, yeah, we've been um, 
Uh, I was um, for many years uh, working as an Aboriginal social worker and one of the, about six years ago, I started the Culture Recode project because I wanted to figure out or try and work out why um, Australian people and Aboriginal people sitting across the table from each other couldn't get their messages clear. And also, what was it that, you know, these invisible forces that stopped us from, from speaking the same language? Um, and so we started, uh, six years ago, we started running um, with Aboriginal people and colonial heritage people scenarios, everyday normal scenarios where we send people on picnics, we follow them, we send them to meetings, um, we did mock um, events, we did, so we, we just constantly were trying to make that invisible um, difference uh, become visible. Uh, and one of the things, what we found in our research, which I think is one of the few in the world that actually has Indigenous people as, um, as a cohort, um, it was that uh, up to nearly 50 behaviours uh, between the two groups was, was seen by each group as the others were doing it incorrectly or inappropriately. And what this, um, so it's things like trust and um, uh, going to a meeting and being interviewed and mentoring, like it's just very common behaviours um, that were judged uh, as being wrong or inappropriate by the other group when we showed them to them. So we started to think, okay, is this different? Is this, um, is this behaviour different? It's actually one of the key reasons for all this conflict that's going on. So we allocated them into collective behaviour and individual behaviour and then started actually showing each other, um, taking people through how to uh, accept that there's two societies and that they're wired differently. Uh, and what it developed into was the most incredible um, program now, which when we engage with people, we teach them how to read cultural behaviour. And by reading cultural behaviour, they actually can engage as that other person requires them. It meets their needs at all times. So we uh, we call it how to honour humans. Uh, and it's based on uh, memory, but it's also based on ancient Aboriginal culture and philosophy, uh, which is a combination you don't see very often. But it actually teaches people how to read um, the behaviour of the other person and know how to communicate as they need them to. And we've trialled this for two years uh, and it's had remarkable, remarkable success. And I certainly, when I sit across from anyone now, I feel absolutely bulletproof in communication. I feel like I can meet the needs of everybody in the room and that's a very rare I never felt like that previously. I can tell you as an Aboriginal person, <laughs> I was I never felt like that. So it's just a sort of remarkable way to engage with people um, at that behavioural level. And I think it has much to offer the world as in how to honour each other, uh, which is my people, you know, as a collective people, the very ain't one of the oldest living cultures on the planet Honour honor is a huge part of who we are and certainly um, I'm, we're excited about what we've uh, actually uncovered. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I look forward to having more. <laughs> do you want to say something briefly? Uh, I'd love to. Uh, Thomas, do you want to make a quick comment? Because this seems to be exciting, which is why I wanted to put you together because I think there's some wonderful overlap. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, well, of course, one, one of the uh, inner capacities that we need to develop in this new world is exactly the one that you are talking about there when it comes to cultural literacy and being able to uh, 
put yourself in other people's shoes and understand the behavior of people that comes from very different uh, uh, cultural background yeah. or even not so cultural different background. I think your situation there is, is quite extreme. I can see the same um, happening in, in, in London uh, or, or Stockholm yeah. between just uh, yeah. Normal people, but but that belongs to a little bit different uh, subcultures or even just generations. So mm -hmm. this um, ability to read other people uh, mm -hmm. is super important. Yeah, fabulous. Well, Mohana, it's, it's, it's superpower, Thomas. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Well, I think the both the both of you really want to connect after this, but I hope everybody. But Mohana, it's obviously wonderful having you here. You're you're originally from India, obviously an ancient culture there. Uh, you're now in Oman with an ancient culture uh, in Oman. I mean, you uh, you know, the whole idea of sharing people's shared heritage and, and thinking about the collective and the individual. Would you like to make any comments on what people have been talking about and what you see in some of your observations? Sure. I, I will say at the outset that I'm the only person on this panel completely um, really unauthorized to talk about this, but I'm going to talk more as an observer. It has been <laughs> a for my life. So when Anthony first told me all about you all, I was seriously um, overawed. Okay, so Oman, I've been here 20 years. It's just going to be 20 years this month. Um, came in as an editor for a business magazine, grew to head a publishing company, and then I finally set up my own business in uh, 2019. Great timing. Anyhow, but living and working in a country you know, where it's quite usual to have at least four different nationalities present in large numbers besides the local Omani in the organization. In the beginning, um, I found everything worked really well. You know, these were family-run uh, organizations by far. The government was the biggest employer, still is. Um, and, you know, few people making decisions. Employees did as they were told. You know, they were paid well, zero income tax helps, people had good lives, and, you know, that was all that mattered. But the first real signs of trouble in paradise really came when Oman had its version of the Arab Spring in 2011. Um, and then, of course, later when the oil prices started collapsing, and the last nail pretty much has been COVID. Now, with revenues declining, the government can no longer absorb the tens of thousands as they did earlier. And it came to the private sector to share the load. And a population we have here where 40% is under the age of 18, unemployment was going to be an issue. Now it came the interesting bit because all of this has begun to highlight that neither, there were very few companies really over the years had ever tried to even look into, see whether the expats and the Omanis or even the Omanis among themselves in the various tribes, whether they were even assimilating or learning at all from each other. And once times got tough, what happened was that rather than a collaborative uh, atmosphere between the various nationalities and the tribes, there was more um, sort of an adversarial approach. And it suddenly became sort of, they went from, we all can work together to, you know, get somewhere. They were just content that way before, but now suddenly, it was all about me versus them. It just became individual uh, way of thinking. Strict organization uh, policies were announced. And also the gaps began to appear because it appeared that there had been no training, no mentoring, or even sharing the vision between expats and Omanis, whoever was in the top position. There was no communication between the C-suite and the board and the rest of the company. Also, in Amman, it is culturally unacceptable, especially if you're in a high position, to admit to not knowing something, to own up to it, or to ask for help. So, leaders began to isolate themselves, and information sharing continued to be sort of a power. Now, what really happened was that there was no common context between nationals and the expatriates. And what was left was trust gradually disappeared. And without companies, uh, you know, working on building a culture where people could be brought together, where they would have common goals, they would know where the company or even the country was headed. So the issues of blocks that lay in their collective path 
it just became more and more difficult because working in silos has always been common in our life. But it worked earlier, uh, both in the government and in the private sector, simply because of the scale. But gradually, now it's become one of the biggest complexes. Plans are made, solutions are found, but again, these are done by individual silos. There's no common pool of stakeholders, you know, who represent all the parts that are necessary to make the wheel move. And the irony is that right now people need to work more collectively than they've ever done before. I mean, COVID itself, this is not something that people can solve unless they're all working together. And that is the greatest need of the moment here in Oman. That is fascinating. I imagine Nola would think that's what's needed in Australia as well. This whole collective uh, and your whole way of seeing individual and collective behaviours. But uh, that's where we sort of have some comments. I'd love to hear Dan's uh, comments. And Dan, please talk a little bit about your whole passion. And uh, because I, the story about Dan, I met him 25 years ago in Japan. I always remember him starting. He went to see his professor when he's doing his PhD, so 30 years ago or more. And he said, I believe if people are involved and they trust each other, they'll be more successful. So the professor said, oh, go away, you're mad. This is this is heresy. People just work for money. And that's sort of the beginning of Dan's fascination and uh, why we've been working. And that's why I think you'll all love each other. and We'll continue talking afterwards. But Dan, please, over to you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. And uh, glad to... Um to meet you, Nola, uh, Mohana, Talats. Um, that's a real treat. Um, you know, um, too bad we don't have an audience here that's, you know, throwing resources at us so that we can continue to uh, meet, talk. Um, uh, you know, because the uh, what I've done, um, oh, you know, I'm kind of like a business school professor that... Um, committed the cardinal sin of doing something useful. Um, and that's kind of caught, you know, caught on. And so I've, I've really spent a good part of my career trying to help people understand the cultures that they've created in organizations, um, primarily business organizations, but all, all types uh, of organizations from the indigenous American uh, tribes to, um, Kids in their garage bands, you know, uh, playing together. Um, but most of it is a, is a corporate uh, practice with a lot of public sector work as well. I was, I was a business school professor at the University of Michigan for the first part of my career. And then at IMD uh, Business School in Lausanne, Switzerland, for the last 15 years or so. And now I'm, I'm retired from that. I, uh, and I still have my own consulting firm um, that, uh, you know, does culture change and transformation work. Uh, and, you know, we're in, uh, do work all over the world um, and have about 30 or 40 people and a lot of consultants that work with us now. And are you, still, are you still in Europe or are you back in the U.S.? No, I'm back in the U.S. It's, yeah. uh, it's sort of 3 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> so if I make even less sense than usual... Um, don't, don't worry, next next time could be worse, you know. <laughs> but um, no, glad to glad to meet you. And the um, it's interesting, you know, life's always a cameo of itself. Um, you know, we build communities. Essentially, that's what people do. Um, confronted with any, you know, uh, anything that's bigger than ourselves, um, which is not hard to find in the world today or ever, um, we build communities. Um, and we have to we have this combination of meaning and of um, function. And it's really a curious thing, you know, and I've studied and read and published and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but, but certainly learned the most um, from practice. Um, Yes, I did a you know fairly good imitation of an academic career, um, but um, you know uh, basically I'm a pretty practical uh, person, and you know I think one of the challenges of our time is that 
understanding how much we lost this last year and a half. Um, and, it, you know, we just, we had a conference um, a couple of weeks ago, and actually we should have had you, Anthony was the speaker, we should have had you guys there, so we at least have had a hundred, you know, 200 people um, that, you know, that would, um, would join us. But it's fascinating how with our backs to the wall, people adapt and adjust with amazing um, commitment, uh, insight, creativity. Um, and so it's like everybody's like totally forgotten what's it like to actually interact uh, with, with people. And now as we come out of this, um, starting, to, starting to travel, starting to interact, um, you know, we're kind of rediscovering that. And I think it's startling how uh, unfamiliar, how uncertain. Yeah, it's fun. And it certainly is like, but I, I didn't primarily um, look at like human interaction as an anomaly in life um, <laughs> a, a year and a half ago. And now we're rebuilding. And one of the, you know, fascinating things to watch and, and, you know, to, to must the um, rooting it all in the emotional and cognitive capacity is, is absolutely right. You know, I for, for years I studied kind of organizational behavior and organizational psychology and all that. And so, well, why don't business people pay more attention to this? It's core to their humanity. And eventually, uh, and in no small part from leading an organization myself, it's like we don't have the capacity. Yeah, there's a lot of things we do, and humans are quite amazingly flexible, really resourceful. Um, but um, the you know the, the life sort of rings us some of that out of us, and in defense of our narrow bandwidth, you know we fall back into kind of habituated behavior, and we've really created some strange habits. Um, this past year, and we're in the process of un, undoing them. Um, I think it's so interesting. Uh, for every conversation that I have with a business leader about what is the value of direct interaction, what is the value of people coming together in person, and, and then how do we structure that as organizations? Um, for every one of those, there's at least 10, if not 100, you know, uh, well, should we have a policy of three days a week or two days or four days? And, you know, it, it's just like so preposterously bureaucratic a response. And, and talk about examples of not having the emotional and cognitive bandwidth. Um yeah, if you said, here's an organization with you know, 50,000 people, how should they think about the use of human interaction to you know, build the organization and to build the community? And you know, that's sort of been my career as I spend a few years asking a stupid question and then go, ah, shit, nobody will ever get it, and then go back to my next stupid question. And then five or ten years later, somebody says, wow, that was a really good idea. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, a, it's really a pleasure yeah. to be part of this distinguished mm -hmm. group. I'm, you know, Nola, I'm very interested in what you've, you know, developed about kind of learning to interact culturally. Um, Mahana, um, we do a lot of work in your part of the world uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, STC actually you know have a um my my next meeting is at one three hours with um stc the saudi telecom uh that's a client uh with their channel you their really need to come to Orlando. Yeah, yeah 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 they're just you're gonna have a lot of fun yeah. honestly yeah yes you know, it's just, well, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fun is fun is good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, yeah. 
But I think the, the, the fun is really helping people see that they can be more effective being collective. I mean, I think this is a sort of complete revelation for people, really, to that's, actually. That's, been, yeah. that's basically been, you know, our livelihood. If you, you know, you, you, you ask some questions in a survey and that helps them to sort of, you know, uh, understand their their culture narrowly defined in a, you know, as um, in, a, in a survey sense, it's much obviously very, very deep, but then they look at it and the, and then they say, well, Oh, Oh, you mean nobody knows where we're going um, or what we're doing and why? What a surprise. How could that be? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, Hit them in the middle of the floor, and then they kind of like mm, oh, oh, the gears start turning, and you know some of them see the the core humanity and the the essential part of that, and and some of them just say, hey, there must be something wrong with this survey, and go back to what they've always done. <laughs> yeah, Tom, Thomas, does this uh, ring true for you with your vision and what you're trying to do? Because uh, I think it's an interesting benchmark that uh, that Dan has created. No, um, uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, I, I really resonate with Dan's comment there about uh, uh, executive uh, emotional and cognitive bandwidth. Yeah, uh, that that's how I came uh, into this field from from business. That was when I was chairman of a banking group in Scandinavia. That I was mm -hmm. working with talented people like Dan leadership and organizational consultants who showed us how important this dimension of inner maturation is in top management mm -hmm. and and how these consultants could actually help facilitate the development of these capacities right. and that for, for me coming from a natural science and finance perspective that was mm -hmm. completely mind-blowing I mean, yes. participating in these leadership development uh, retreats and other things and see the effect on myself and on, on the management team and that we were actually able to then function better, not just as a group, but uh, in the organization and I would argue also in, in the world. Uh, and then thinking something along the lines, well, if we in the corporate world, at least part of the corporate world, it, it understands the importance of this inner development maturation of consciousness development or development of these capacities or whatever language you want to use, how come that we are not at all talking about this in society? We're talking about lifelong learning in society, yes, yeah. that we might need to learn to program in the middle of our lives or change mm -hmm. career or something. But this inner development and maturation, which is, I'm, I'm completely secular, but still sometimes I, I use the spiritual language because I think this is what the, what religions and indigenous cultures yeah. have been on to for millennia of years, supporting us all in this lifelong process. And then for some reason in, in the West, we have completely forgotten this yeah. dimension. And yeah. I, I think our collective amnesia here is at least part of the problem that we are today <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean there, it, yeah there's a lot to forget you know <laughs> <laughs> what about being about being human but i mean i entirely agree I sorry <laughs> what yeah i i think um you know dan one of the things we found with our working with corporates here in australia in our with our program I, in the end, um, developed a, a program where we do purpose alignment. Mm -hmm. We ask them to align their purpose um, with actually how uh, collective people behave. And that to them became a little bit too revealing how their, yes. um, their purpose, yes. their goals were quite external, Thomas, not really dealing with internal at all. Yes. And when you say to them, okay, for a collective person like me, my my greatest treasure, my the thing I'm loyal most to, the thing that I'm committed most to, is that my family 
are happy, healthy, and wealthy. That's that's my number one goal in life. That's that. So that purpose you have of employing average, more Aboriginal people, how does that align with that? And then when you start to look at how that does not align with that, uh, their business, their organisation, their, 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 their policies, um, people start to get very skittish and nervous. So it's been purpose alignment has become... Um, our, our program, our go-to with corporates, and there's a few corporates that are not liking us very much. <laughs> yeah, but you, I think the, the thing we've all been in, I mean, I was chatting to Thomas the other day and he was saying, you know, 10 years ago he's being accused of being a communist for having these ideas. Um, you know, Dan was perceived to be a heretic because he just didn't focus on profit. Nola was saying she's been working for 20 years and finally there's an interest in it. And I think Mahana in the past, it was just everything was fine in Dubai, in, uh, in the Middle East or in Oman. Everything is fine in the silo. And I think this is what is so exciting. Nola's telling me now there's interest. I've been saying the same thing for 40 years and people are finally going, this is actually how do we create some humanity, humility and let us start with that. And, uh, I think maybe a, a comment of something that you'd, you'd love to, achieve because i feel with uh, 